Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the fall season of the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I'm Carrie Otterburn of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Today, we are joined by Professor Anu Bradford to discuss her latest book, The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World, published this year by Oxford University Press. Professor Anu Bradford is the Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organization at Columbia Law School. She is also a director for the European Legal Studies Center and a senior scholar at the Jerome A. Chazen Institute for Global Business. Her research and teaching focus on European Union law, international trade law, and comparative and international antitrust law. Before joining the law school faculty in 2012, she was an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Also joining us today as discussant is Dr. Axel Marx. Axel is Deputy Director of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at the University of Leuven since its inception in 2007. He is also involved as a lead researcher in the GLOBE project, focusing on trade and sustainable development and new forms of governance. His research interests include voluntary sustainability standards, sustainable development, business and human rights, EU trade policy, and comparative case methods. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Anu of about 25 minutes. Then Axel will start off the discussion by offering his reflections and asking a few questions, and Anu will have an opportunity to respond. Then we will turn to questions from the audience. Feel free to send questions to me throughout the webinar by using the webinar chat box function on the side of the webinar window. I will collect your questions to share with the speakers following the presentation. Before we begin, just a few words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance with specific attention to four key areas, trade and development, security and migration, climate change, and global finance. The three and a half year project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world, as well as to look ahead to 2030 and 2050 in order to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. On behalf of the GLOBE project, I would like to thank both Anu and Axel for joining us today. And now it is my great pleasure to give the floor to Anu. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Axel, for inviting me. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. So let me maybe start uh, with the question of why I wrote the book. Um, and the, the reason really is, if you listen to the news, you uh, follow the conversation, it is really dominated by this narrative that Europe's best days are over, that the EU is increasingly a declining, powerless global entity that has little ability to influence the state of the affairs globally. And against this narrative, in my own research and teaching, I kept coming across constant examples of tremendous influence that the European Union has across the world. And the book is an attempt to capture that influence and hence complete the narrative of what really is the European Union's role in the world. So if I think about certain industries, let's start from the big technology companies, the powerful ones in the United States like Facebook and Google and Microsoft. What kind of privacy policy do these companies have? They follow the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, not only with respect to the uh, data subjects in the EU, but across their operations around the world. If you think about, again, a set of uh, tech companies like Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, how do they determine what constitutes hate speech and hence what kind of speech they take down from their platforms. They don't look at the First Amendment of the US Constitution. Instead, they follow the European definition of what constitutes hate speech. And these American technology companies and the digital economy are not the only examples where the European law penetrates across the global market, uh, marketplace and shapes the global behavior of companies around the world. So we also find examples. Let's think about, for instance, how timber is harvested in Indonesia. That is defined by EU regulation. EU regulation also uh, tells Cameroonian farmers what pesticides to use. The EU regulations also determine what kind of facilities Chinese dairy factories put in place. 
they determine what kind of chemicals Japanese toy manufacturers use in their toys. And they determine what kind of uh, and how much privacy is afforded to internet users across Latin America. So what would make these foreign companies obey European law, not only when they do business in the EU, but around the world? So here, the answer lies in what I have uh, termed the Brussels effect. And by the Brussels effect, I refer to the European Union's unilateral ability to regulate the global marketplace. The EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. But often these companies do not only choose to follow the EU law with respect to their business in the EU. Instead, they apply the EU law globally in order to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So by adhering to the most stringent regulator, these companies can follow a uniform rule yet be in compliance around the world. And often that most stringent rule is a European rule. That happens when we talk about competition policy, data protection, when we talk about environmental regulation, consumer protection, food safety, you name it. So this is really uh, a, uh, what, what the book focuses on, to articulate the conditions under which we see the global companies follow this rule. But let me pause for a moment to ask the question, why the Brussels effect? Why not the Washington effect or the Beijing effect? The EU is certainly not the only large market around the world. China is a very large market, and so is the United States. But what the book tells you is that even though a large market size is absolutely the starting point, that is not enough. You also need to have the regulatory capacity to unleash that market power embedded in your vast market size and convert that into tangible regulatory influence. And that is something that China is still in the process of building. It does not match the regulatory capacity that is vested in the, the various European institutions uh, in Brussels. In the United States, there is plenty of regulatory capacity. The problem is, for if the US wanted to set the, the, the rules for the world, is that the US has chosen to let that capacity largely rest idle. The US has chosen not to deploy that capacity because there is very little political will to do so. So you don't only need to have the large market size, you need to have the regulatory capacity combined with a political commitment to deploy that capacity. And, and that is something that the US abandoned really uh, is since the early 1990s, the US has pursued a very strong deregulatory agenda. And it inadvertently at the same time, largely seeded the stage for the global regulations for the EU, right at the time when the EU was ramping up its commitment to build a single market. And the EU largely built a single market through regulation. So the EU was really pursuing its internal goal to create a robust internal market. But that internal goal turned out having a large inadvertent side effect for making the EU as the regulator of the global marketplace at the same time. So um, those are the, the, the sort of basic contours of the, the Brussels, Brussels effect. And what the book also does is that it invites the reader to think what kind of power matters today. So it is a rather outdated way to think about power merely in terms of, let's say, military power, the hard power. That is the kind of power that is very costly to deploy. Also, if we think about economic sanctions, conditional lending, those are very difficult and can often be undermined by others. What makes the Brussels effect different and very powerful is that it is the kind of power that is very difficult to undermine by anybody else. It is something that doesn't require the EU to engage in coercion. It is not imposing its standards on anybody. 
It is also not dependent on foreign countries' cooperation. All the EU needs to do is to regulate the single market, and it is then the global companies whose self-interest leads these companies to voluntarily apply these standards across the global marketplace and hence proliferate those standards or help those standards proliferate across the global marketplace. So it is the kind of power that is resilient and it is particularly important because it affects each and every one of us each and every day. It affects the food we eat, the air we breathe and the products we produce and consume. So um, the Brussels effect is not a normative theory. The book does not celebrate what the EU does, nor does it criticize it. It is really for the, the reader to determine whether the Brussels effect is something that should be welcome around the world, whether it enhances the welfare of Europeans and citizens of the world, or whether it is a cause for concern. But I do engage in the book with a few normative criticisms that can be leveled against the Brussels effect. And let me now walk you through those three different criticisms that I consider the primary ways to frame the conversation about whether the Brussels effect is good or bad. So the first criticism is that many people fear that regulation is costly and it compromises the, uh, the economic progress competitiveness and innovative capacities of Europe. And if the Brussels effect then multiplies the regulation, we actually see less innovation across the world. And I think this narrative is something that we cannot brush away too lightly, nor should we make too much of that and assume that every time regulation leads to less innovation and less efficient production. But I talked to a Silicon Valley a tech executive, and I asked him what he thought the main difference was when dealing with European or American regulatory authorities. And he said, look, what the Europeans want us to do is to satisfy a consumer need. What the Americans want us to do is to change the world or allow the world to be changed. And if every company around the world was only working towards satisfying a consumer need as opposed to changing the world, I think some of the most disruptive innovations would never take place. And that would be uh, harmful to the world welfare. But at the same time, I think it would be too quick to conclude that every time regulation is a synonym for a less efficiency, less competitiveness and less innovation. So if you think about, for instance, many environmental energy efficiency regulations, those can be those products very good for the environment, but they can also lead the companies to develop much more efficient technologies that also uh, uh, increase their productivity. If we think about, for instance, competition regulation, today there is a much more robust uh, commitment to regulate the marketplace in Europe through competition law than in the United States. And the result is that the European market is actually more competitive. The concentration levels are much higher in the United States, which means that the profits for the corporations are much higher as well, and consumer prices in many critical areas. Whether we talk about internal flights, I pay much less when I fly from Brussels to Madrid than what I pay if I want to fly from New York to Chicago. Cell phone plans are another example where the lack of competition due to lack of competition enforcement has led the prices to be very high in the United States. So the question of whether the Brussels effect increases the costs and reduces innovation is somewhat more nuanced than many people would necessarily immediately uh, recognize. Let me focus on a second criticism, uh, which is very prevalent, especially in the United States, and I would say especially when it comes to competition enforcement. So if you look at who Commissioner Feshtager is going against, you generally see that the EU enforcement in competition law targets American big technology companies. And there is this prevailing narrative often in the US that this is a protectionist move on behalf of the EU. 
This is industrial policy. It's the EU's attempt to level the playing field by giving a leg up to the European companies that just cannot compete with more innovative and more efficient American counterparts. And this is the kind of uh, criticism that the book quite uh, directly takes on and, uh, and concludes that it is unlikely that the EU regulation would be driven by protectionist, mo protectionist motives, at least systematically. So first of all, if you look at these competition cases, is there a European search engine that the Commission is trying to protect when it's, when it's taking cases against Google? No. Often, these cases had the main beneficiary in the United States as well. So the initial complaint against Google was brought by Microsoft to the Commission. Whereas when Microsoft was the target of a European competition investigation earlier on, again, we had a coalition American companies that were on the other side of the dispute. So we actually often see both losers and winners being American companies. This is not a US versus EU contest, but it's rather a reflection how the American companies are outsourcing their competition disputes to the EU because the EU is much more willing to entertain them and much more willing to watch the marketplace and intervene, unlike the American counterparts. So the protectionism narrative is always somewhat more questionable if you recognize that the EU policies, whether we talk about environment or food safety, the, the genetically modified organisms, they reflect a very deeply held and genuine consumer preferences as opposed to interests of the industry in the EU. So those are some of the issues that I think undermine the idea that the EU would be primarily motivated by industrial policy and hence distorting the marketplace with protectionist regulatory uh, goals. So let me now move on to the third criticism that has often been presented. And that is the idea that the EU is behaving like a regulatory imperialist. It is imposing its regulations on countries, constituencies, consumers around the world and making consumers basically assume and adopt the choices that reflect European consumers' preferences and not theirs. All the consumers around the world do not want to, for instance, pay more for products that are more sustainable. It is the European consumers that have the luxury to care about sustainability. But at the same time, also this narrative of the, the foreign consumers and stakeholders' political autonomy being compromised through the Brussels effect, it is a somewhat questionable, uh, questionable assumption because in the end, the EU is not imposing its regulations anywhere. The EU cannot be said to be an imperialist if Facebook decides to adopt a GDPR across the world. So in the end, the EU is only guarding and regulating its own market, which it has a full sovereign right to do. And there's also an interesting uh, conversation in the United States where many United States stakeholders, consumers, for instance, feel that their government has abandoned them. The role of money and lobbying in the U.S. regulatory process has led to the situation where the U.S. regulation doesn't fully reflect the preferences of a undistorted democratic process in the United States. Hence, many American consumers welcome that they feel the Brussels effect. So at least somebody is giving them the kind of protections and offsetting the role of big money that has led to the two low levels of regulations in the United States. So again, that is my attempt to invite the conversation that is a little bit more nuanced than simply put, is regulation good or bad? Is regulation imperialist or is it not? So in, uh, in my last five minutes or so, let me uh, now move to the last chapter of the book, which looks into the future of the Brussels effect. And it asks the question whether the Brussels effect will last. And uh, I will engage with certain, and I do engage in the book with certain external and internal criticisms or, or, or developments rather that might challenge uh, the EU's global regulatory power. 
So let's start, for instance, from China and the idea that maybe one day, not that long from now, we have the Beijing effect, replace the Brussels effect, as China will be writing the rules for the world. So here, the book certainly does not uh, question the importance of the Chinese market and the fact that inevitably, the relative share of the European market of the global marketplace will decline. Europe will be a less significant market going forward. It would seem to follow from that that also the Brussels effect is more threatened because the starting point is that you need to be a large market. So maybe in the future we have more companies that have opportunities to abandon the EU market if the regulation is too stringent and rather than trade elsewhere and divert those commercial opportunities to growing markets like China. But I am doubtful that China will be building the regulatory capacity so fast and also that the Chinese are willing to craft as stringent regulations anytime soon. Because if you think about the political will to regulate, it is more of a function of a GDP per capita than the GDP as such. It is only when you have a substantial, robust uh, uh, consumer at power, where the consumers are wealthy enough to care about sustainability, to care about data protection, to care about uh, the food safety, that you have enough pressure for the government to act. And by the time the Chinese consumers are wealthy enough, we most likely will have seen the GDP growth of China to slow down to the extent that the government itself might be less willing to impose any stringent regulations if those regulations might further dampen the GDP growth in China. So the argument that I make in the book is not that Chinese growth is not significant because it is, or that the EU's GDP will somehow keep up with the pace of that, relatively speaking, of the rest of the world, but rather that the EU's regulatory power will outlive the EU's power measured merely based on the GDP. So uh, let me now mention a couple of other potential threats to the Brussels effect. So one is technological developments, and the companies may increasingly be in a position to tailor different products, uh, tailor different products for different markets, and basically comply with different regulations, which they are not as much willing to do today. But if we see developments, for instance, in 3D printing, you can tailor your products for different markets. You do not need to think about scale economies and having the most stringent regulation apply to all your products. So we see internet companies increasingly splintering the internet by using the IP address as a proxy of what kind of regulations we are developing for our different markets. Geolocation is not accurate. It has sometimes cost on the business models of the companies, but there is a potential that these technologies are increasingly deployed to, uh, to make the markets divisible and hence limit the application of the EU regulation to the EU market alone. But let me now focus on what I think is an interesting internal constraint uh, on the, the EU's regulatory power. So first of all, we see an increase in the anti-EU sentiment, which may then undermine the political will and regulatory capacity of the EU. But if you think about the anti-EU populist parties, they are not worried about food safety or that much about data protection. They worry about migration, judiciary, free press, as opposed to the core tenants of the, the, uh, the regulatory power that is vested in the single market. Another internal development, though, is Brexit. And, and, and the book does engage with the idea whether the Brexit will actually undermine uh, the Brussels effect. And it reaches the conclusion that more than Brexit could undermine the Brussels effect, it is the Brussels effect that is undermining Brexit. So even though the EU lost a substantial chunk of its market share, it lost the important regulatory capacity with losing the British, uh, uh, the civil servants and different, um, the British capacity to the negotiate and, and bring its voice to the EU. We also might see actually more regulation after the UK has left. And what we certainly will see is that this promise by the Brexit campaign 
that the Brexit would somehow liberate the UK from the EU's regulatory reach and that regulatory sovereignty would evade the UK on the other side of Brexit. That will turn out to be a false promise because of the Brussels effect. The EU is the most important market. Almost 50% of the UK exports are destined to the EU. And that will not change after Brexit. The EU is the number one destination for critical UK industries, ranging from um, automobiles to aerospace, uh, to pharmaceuticals, chemicals, financial services. So if you are an automobile manufacturer in the UK, do you want to produce your uh, cars to meet the standards of the EU, the market that is six times bigger than your domestic market? And if you need that EU market, do you really want to set up a second production line in order to produce to a different standard, in order to meet the home market uh, uh, demand based on different regulatory standards? No, you will not have the incentive to do that. Moreover, what the UK may find out is that after Brexit, it will be actually living in an ever more tightly regulated Europe. The UK has chosen to become a rule taker as opposed to rule maker. And it will no longer has, have its say around the tables where those regulations are being drafted. So that important pro-market voice that was often skeptical of, skeptical of regulation, that will be gone. And there will be more space for the voices of more pro-regulation companies like France to craft the regulatory policies for the EU. So in that sense, uh, it is really a false promise, as I call it, and that the UK will not be able to deliver on that kind of promise going forward. So that, again, I don't think will be a way to, uh, to think about a future whereby Brussels effect would be less important. Obviously, a lot has changed uh, since uh, the, I wrote the book because the world was upended with the pandemic. I'm also happy to talk about where the COVID-19 will mean the end uh, to the Brussels effect. But let me actually pass it on now to um, Axel and then to the questions from the audience so that we can engage with the particular aspects of the book that you are most interested in discussing. So thank you and I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Anu, for this engaging presentation of the key arguments of your excellent book. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Axel to kick off today's discussion. And I'd also like to remind the audience that the question and answer session will begin shortly. So I invite you to send me any of your questions through the webinar chat box feature. Uh, Axel, you have the floor. Thank you, Kerry, and thank you, Professor Bradford, for a wonderful presentation and also for a wonderful, and if I may say, brilliant book about uh, the Brussels effect and it's actually quite inspiring to read let's say a more positive account of certain developments in a time of crisis we don't only have COVID but we have also a lot of internal issues as you also already mentioned in the EU we have the migration crisis we have Brexit many things piling up but your account also gives a very other perspective on on, on the EU I must say also that the, the book has been extremely well received and you've got really great comments and, and reviews and as one of the leading, let's say, um, academics on the EU uh, uh, rights, Professor Andrew Ravich of uh, Princeton, he wrote about the book, this may well be the single most important book on Europe's global influence to appear in a decade. So that's a really uh, reigning uh, endorsement of the book and I can only echo it. Uh, the book is a very rich combination of case studies, but what I think really stands out is that you bring everything together in a very coherent theoretical argument why we observe the Brussels effect uh, with regard to what the EU is doing rather than opposed to what's happening in the US and China. And you do that on bringing uh, together a combination of factors which uh, uh, contribute uh, uh, to that effect. In, in, in a way, it also echoes a bit, and you also acknowledge that in, in, in the book, some of the work which has been done previously by David Vogel on the California effect. And you also have this very nice combination of really rich empirics, theoretically very founded, and that creates a very convincing uh, narrative on policy dynamics and policy uh, developments. 
The book also, as you uh, highlighted very nicely in the presentation, engages with a lot of possible debates and, and also current developments on Brexit, on protectionism, and you already outlined it very nicely in the, in the presentation what the arguments for and against are, but in the book you really substantiate that with a lot of empirical evidence and really makes a very convincing read and argument um, um, uh, in, in the book. If I can also say on the, let's say, very interesting aspect of the book, and which I liked a lot, was that you really combine a lot of different disciplinary insights to make the narrative. You rely on legal scholarship, you rely on political science, on economics, on management studies, uh, and to uh, bring that together in, in a coherent whole uh, is, is a very uh, a large achievement. Also, what I like about the book is that you really bring to the ground and to the forefront how maybe sometimes very abstract concepts like standards, regulatory approaches, um, regulatory convergence really have a day-to-day -day impact on us consumers, on farmers, on business people, and so on. So what we actually uh, sometimes analyze in an abstract way as really day-to-day -day, um, uh, implications. So I would highly recommend the book, and I'm, ver I'm very sure it will be read uh, in the classrooms and outside classrooms for a, a very, uh, very long time. So thank you very much for that contribution. Maybe to kick off uh, the, the discussion and the q and I prepared some, uh, uh, some questions. And maybe the first question I wanted to pose, and you did not already go in depth in the presentation on that, but one thing which uh, 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 made me think a little bit was, you have very convincing case studies in the book where you show how the Brussels effect works and how actually internal dynamics create some kind of, let's say, a global governance of rules which originates in, in the EU. But you discuss that with regard to the specific uh, uh, policy areas in, in the book. And the question there is, uh, does that Brussels effect hold for all policy areas? For instance, uh, finance or, or, or other areas where you have some kind of, let's say, global rules, or maybe for other policy areas, there might be a Washington effect in the sense that uh, domestic rules made in the US are globalized and are followed by, by firms uh, uh, all over the world. And if there is a variation between policy areas, how would you explain that? Um, and maybe as a second follow-up uh, question is um, uh, related to the types of standards and rules which the EU, let's say, exports globally. Um, maybe one could make a distinction between, on the one hand, hard technical type uh, of standards, and on the other hand, maybe more soft normative type of standards. And the hard technical standards, they go into reach, which you discuss in, in the book, but also um, uh, specific standards with regard to consumer protection. And the softer standards, we think more about in terms of uh, labor rights, human rights, um, which are um, uh, um, uh, integrated in, in EU policies. And we see that the EU already is doing that, for instance, with regard to the soft standards and free trade agreements in the GSP scheme. And you also discuss that in the book, and you're quite skeptical about it, uh, and to the degree that this really is having a, an effect. Do you think that the Brussels effect plays out differently between whether you want to, let's say, globalize technical standards versus more soft standards, or does that not play a role at all? And maybe we can start it off here, and then, uh, Gary, if we have other questions from the audience, we can feed them in. Great. Um, thank you, Axel, uh, for your kind words about the book and for these terrific questions. So let's talk about the variance across uh, policy areas, and then on your second question on hard versus soft standards. So in terms of variance, I think what you mentioned first, finance, that's a really interesting, I would say, counterexample. Because the book walks you through the theory, what, what predicts the, the emergence and appearance of the Brussels effect. And one of the criteria after the market size, the regulatory capacity, the political will to regulate, uh, to deploy that capacity, is what is the target that you're trying to regulate? And the target really needs to be inelastic. 
as opposed to elastic. So the EU mainly focuses on regulating the environment or the consumer markets, and you cannot move the EU consumers away from the EU or the environmental impacts, whereas money is, is, is more mobile. You can list your stock outside of the EU, and if the EU's financial regulation is too stringent, capital will flee. And that constrains your ability to be a unilateral regulatory power relying on the company's self-interest when it comes to finance. So you are right that Washington has been often taking the lead when it comes to the regulation of finance. But even for the US, it meets its limitations to rely on the market-based convergence, the logic of the Brussels effect, for the same reason that the capital ultimately is mobile if it doesn't like the US regulatory regime. Also, there are, however, other ways to leverage your power, and the U.S. has a lot of financial power through financial sanctions, but those, for instance, follow a very different logic, and they are more costly and contentious politically to use than the Brussels effect that can harness the self-interest of the companies. But we generally do see uh, examples, and I try to bring those in the book, both where we see the Brussels effect, but also examples like finance that I discuss where the logic doesn't apply. To me, an interesting example uh, coming from the, the trade space where the logic of the Brussels effect doesn't apply is that the Brussels effect assumes that you can adhere to the EU standard and that EU standard encompasses the other standards around the world, meaning the standards can be consistent with the EU. There are few company, few countries that, for instance, would force you to include certain harmful chemicals that the EU prohibits meaning the company could not at the same time comply with the EU and not comply with another country's regulation. But it happens, for instance, if we think about the famous or infamous example of chlorinated chicken. If the EU says we don't want the chicken to be rinsed with chlorine, and the US says we want you to rinse the chicken with chlorine so that it's safe for the consumers, you basically need to choose. You either need to serve one market or the other, or you need to end up setting up the second production line, have a different factory that uh, operates uh, uh, following the different rules. So when we have incompatible standards, that is another example. If you have country like the EU that doesn't want cosmetics to be tested on animals, but at least until recently, China has required animal testing as the way to show that the cosmetics are safe. The companies, because China is picking up of the market, they have produced separate cosmetics tested on animals for China. But if it had been a smaller country, you are Costa Rica and you say, we want to have a certain kind of regulations, the company would just abandon doing trade in Costa Rica. So those are just some examples of when we do not see the logic of the Brussels effect operate. Let's then talk about uh, the soft versus hard standards. And um, I distinguish in the book uh, across the different types of power that the EU has. And the Brussels effect is certainly not the only way uh, for the EU to try to export its regulations and influence standard setting in the world. And you are very right to mention the trade agreements as an important vehicle to try to export norms and also export values embedded in those norms. And the EU often has relied on trade agreements to try to change the labor rights practices or environmental standards or human rights in its trading partners' jurisdictions. What makes trade agreements tricky, though, that they are sometimes hard to enforce? The EU has a rather mixed record in actually holding its trading partners accountable, whereas with the Brussels effect, the enforcement problem is resolved ex ante. You already, no matter if you can't get your trading partners to be persuaded to change their laws, you basically have companies obey your laws because it is in their self-interest to do so. The EU doesn't need to leverage any power to try to enforce uh, a compliance. But let me just also follow up maybe on this <coughs> distinction of technical or, or soft versus hard standards. I think in many ways that the more technical standards where the Brussels effect happens, they are at the same time not standards that are technical, meaning devoid of values. If the EU is exporting its uh, data protection regime, it is exporting very deeply held, fun held fundamental rights values relating to human dignity and the personal privacy. The same thing if we think about a lot of the environmental norms, the fight against the, the try to mitigate climate change, 
this is something where the EU can leverage the market forces and harness the self-interest of global companies to advance values of sustainability that are, I think, on par with the EU's commitments to human rights and, and labor standards. So in many ways, yes, they may be technical, but at the same time, they are standards that are informed by very important values for the EU. Thank you very much. Uh, Kerry, do you want to get some questions from the audience? Yes, we have actually several questions that have come in. Um, and one was sort of already answered so uh, by Simon Scherer, so I won't go into that one yet. Oh, we have a follow-up to that, so maybe I will. But I will start off with a question from Michelle Egan from American University, who asks, uh, what if states don't have the, regular, the regulatory capacity to implement the Brussels rules? It's one thing to accept specific ones in a free trade agreement, but compliance and implementation are different. This sort of speaks to what you were just talking about. What are the economic consequences in terms of regulatory inequality that this creates, especially for least developed countries seeking market access in Europe? And the second question um, is coming from Iblin Roman. Um, apologies if I get anyone's name wrong. Uh, who's asking if you could comment on the Brussels effect and the impact on the implementation of the, of the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. And third, we have a question from Gail Cardu who asks, Will the EU's push for more technology sovereignty have an effect on regulation? So if we want to start with those three, and then we can move on to a second or third round. Right, those are big and, and wonderful, very welcome questions. So first, Michelle's question on regulatory inequality. So in many ways, I make this distinction in the book between what I call de facto Brussels effect and de jure Brussels effect. De facto meaning that no matter what the uh, governments around the world to do, uh, the companies choose to follow the EU rule. So even if we have President Trump uh, decide to uh, 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 release the companies from the burden of uh, complying with some chemical safety regimes, the companies may choose to follow the more stringent EU rule regardless. That's the de facto Brussels effect. And compliance with those rules depends on the the regulatory capacity of these companies to comply rather than the regulatory capacity and potential inequalities in those the capacities that the governments uh, would have. But even there, I think I take this opportunity to mention that I do worry to some extent on the, on the inequality of the capacities of the companies to comply. And it is, I am not worried whether Google can comply with the EU regulations and whether they can bear the cost of complying with the EU regulations. I worry more about the small guys. I worry about the small companies where the relative cost of regulatory compliance is higher. And this is where the EU may actually be undermining its own goal to try to give the small and medium-sized companies also the opportunity to compete on a fair marketplace. So I think the EU needs to be even more mindful to think about uh, the companies that are not as resourceful uh, when it's thinking about the cost of compliance with its uh, regulations. So it might be entrenching the power of the big tech because only those companies uh, find it very easy actually to comply with the EU regulations. But let me then mention, because you may have also been concerned about the regulatory capacities and associated inequalities when we talk about the de, de jure Brussels effect. So the countries around the world deciding to follow the EU's template and, and basically emulate the EU's regulatory regime. That happens a lot. We have over 100 countries now with the domestic data protection regulation following the GDPR. There is no federal American privacy law, for instance, that would be an alternative template. The EU has become a template for many governments around the world to also follow the antitrust, the competition law of the EU. There too, I sometimes worry that we have countries emulating the EU regulations uh, for motivations that may not be fully reflected on what their domestic needs are. The EU regulation may be well regarded, it may be the gold standard, but sometimes it doesn't fully respond to the local conditions and the kinds of regulations or the regulatory priorities that some of these countries uh, would have. So I'm a little bit more cautious, for instance, and this comes a little bit back to our earlier conversation, when the EU imposes a certain regimes, 
uh, through trade agreements, then the EU should be also prepared to give technical assistance, which the EU often does, to help these countries implement the regulations. Otherwise, we see this massive gap between law in books and law in action, where the countries have this empty sham uh, laws that they are in no position to enforce. But I must say that the EU is generally pretty good uh, also entrenching its power by giving the kind of technical assistance to many regimes around the world that has helped with the regulatory compliance efforts that these countries would face. So that's about regulatory inequality. Then there was a question on 2030 sustainability goals. I would just think about how important this issue is with you think about the priorities of this commission with the, the Green Deal and the, the elevation of the goal to fight the climate change, for instance. And there I would see that the Brussels effect is an important uh, among other instruments in the toolkit that the EU has. So first of all, many of the environmental goals, including climate change, cannot be resolved by the EU alone. At the same time, the international cooperation um, has become increasingly fragile and the multinational institutions have lost a lot of their ability to deliver important outcomes, especially with the US abandoning, for instance, the Paris Agreement. So in many ways, the EU needs to rely relatively more on unilateralism if it cannot operate effectively through its preferred mode, the multilateral institutions. The EU would love to work together with other countries to resolve this issue. So there I see that, for instance, if you look at the elements of the Green Deal, there are many um, uh, examples where the Brussels effect could help, for instance, to uh, change the global practices when it comes to uh, the, the uh, the use of plastics in products it comes to eco design, the way we make the products more sustainable. Yet there are many other elements like the carbon tariff that follows a more coercive logic. I am not saying that that wouldn't be an example of the, the fight that is worth uh, for the EU to take on, but I'm also don't want to oversell that the sustainability goals can be accomplished by the Brussels effect alone. But less effective the international cooperation, the more the onus is on the EU to try to do it then alone. But finally, the technology sovereignty, another of my uh, favorite uh, issues to think about. So if we uh, wonder where the emphasis of the EU's action is, it is on the Green Deal and it is on, on the, the Digital Services Act and the future of regulating technology. And there I think that the stakes are extremely high. And let me start by saying to the Axel's question, this goes way beyond technical standards governing technology. We talk about very different values that are promoted by this kind of techno libertarian American view, which I think has shown its limits in many ways. There are very few people who would think today that you can leave the regulation totally to the companies who will always act in the best interest of the users and the society. There's massive threats to democracy. There are massive threats to data privacy. And these companies need to be regulated. I think we are have, arriving in a some consensus on that. How is a much harder question. We also have this Chinese way, which I call more of a digital, author, digital authoritarianism, which relies on extensive state surveillance, which the Europeans are very uncomfortable with, and which the Americans are very uncomfortable with. So this European view, which I have termed, the, termed the, the, the regulatory, the digital paternalism, often offers a more appealing path in the sense that it recognizes the need to regulate, but it also recognizes that we cannot go this kind of authoritarian surveillance route. So the EU has a very important voice in this debate, but the EU also needs to understand that in order to have technological sovereignty, it is not enough to be the global regulator. It cannot just be the referee in the tech war. It needs to get on the field and make sure that it is a major player when it comes to development of technology. And here I am again going back to my conversation. More regulation doesn't mean, more, mean uh, uh, less innovation. It would give the, or should give the EU a reassurance that the EU has the ability to be there in, in, in writing the, the rules for the game, 
which means the EU should be investing in the development of these technologies because it can prevail uh, given the regulatory framework that it can uh, influence. So that would mean there needs to be much more focus on the talent uh, that the EU, which would mean much more proactive immigration policy. It would mean the completion of the capital markets so that these uh, startups can raise capital in a way that they can become profitable and grow uh, in Europe. And there's a bunch of other uh, reforms, including bankruptcy laws, so that you have a second chance, like in the US, after you have failed in the domain of developing technology. So there's much that the EU needs to do to be a credible player. And regulation is an important toolkit, but it's not the only thing that the EU needs to focus on. Great, thank you. So we have time for another round of questions, I think, um, at least one. And so first I'll start with one from Yanis Karagiannis, who's wondering how um, the Brussels effect is analytically different from the California effect that Axel also mentioned um, during his discussion. And we have yep. one from Maximilian Reichert, who's asking, how aware are EU policymakers and heads of state of this soft power of the Brussels effect? And is there a discussion under the surface on how best to utilize it for European interests? And third, we have one from Kazuko Ito, who's wondering about mandatory human rights due diligence legislation that is being considered um, by various states and also at the EU level. And do you think that the Brussels effect, how, how will the, this interplay with the Brussels effect and will it help in the area of human rights regulation? Right, so let me start from the last question, which I think is very important, but something that I already mentioned that I find that the Brussels effect is less able to discipline the human rights practices. It's one of those where the EU needs to rely more on diplomacy, it needs to rely on trade agreements, it needs to rely on cooperation. It's one of those where the companies do not often find that there are scale economies of having the, uh, the, the same EU human rights standards to be obeyed across the global marketplace. It was the same with the labor standards. There are very few benefits of giving the European uh, a, a leave policies or vacation policies for your employers in other parts of the world. But, um, but there, there are many other, including reputational issues, where, for instance, many uh, NGOs are using the EU regulations as an important way to lobby the legislators and lobby the decision makers to shame the companies. So it is not that the EU regulations could not be used by various stakeholders to advance also the dissemination of European standards uh, in human rights. Um, then California effect. So I, I uh, pay the tribute to David Vogel as the, the father of the California effect and that was an important inspiration for the book. What is different about the Brussels effect? So first of all, California effect focuses on the United States market. And it more focuses on the political dynamic that is unleashed by these benefits of adhering to a higher uh, regulatory standard, how that often gives the incentive uh, for the other states to then follow, for instance, the, the, the more stringent Californian standards in the environmental uh, regulation. And the main contribution, which is just terrific by David Focal, is that he explains how the political economy changes. When you have, for instance, the, the car manufacturers that need to follow the emission standards of California, now follow those standards, but they then become advocates and lobby for those standards so that they would be followed uh, by the legislators in other states as well. So, for instance, what David Fogel and the California effect suggest and we see is that Mike Zuckerberg not only uh, uh, focuses on the de facto uh, uh, Brussels effect by adhering to the GDPR globally, he asked the U.S. Congress to enact a federal privacy law that the U.S. should have a GDPR type of law in the U.S. as well. That is sort of the key, the political dynamic that was uh, uh, explored in the California effect. So the Brussels effect is, uh, is an, it, uh, it explains how it happens globally and how it happens uh, and those uh, standards deviate, uh, uh, the depart um, uh, starting from the EU. But it also then uh, tries to offer a more nuanced and complete theoretical framework by articulating the five criteria that are key for the Brussels effect to occur. So both David Vogel and I recognize the market size, the regulatory capacity, 
and then also the political uh, will. But then the Brussels effect brings this analytical distinction between elastic and inelastic targets. And the final criteria, we haven't talked about it a lot in, in terms of theory, but through examples, this indivisibility of production. So what are the conditions under which the companies find it in their interest to adhere to a single rule as opposed to take advantage of multiple uh, different regulatory regimes? So it builds on and expands the, the, uh, the California effect. And it also shows that it happens globally and not just in environmental law where it initially was developed, but in many different areas around the world. And the final question on whether the EU is aware of this. Well, I guess now they are. And uh, when I was giving the, giving the talks in Brussels, uh, some people say that I, I think I know you're doing a disservice because this has been so effective because it was under the radar and it wasn't <laughs> politicized. And the EU was able to use this quiet power. And now we're no longer as quiet about it. So in many ways, the book actually says that initially it was not an intended conscious policy. It started from the regulatory state that was built to complete the internal market. The external effect was an afterthought. But when you look at the communications by the institutions, in particular the commission, you see a shift in around 2010, after which you start seeing references to the external effect of the regulations. So today, I would say that the EU is more aware of it, even before the book, and more consciously trying to see whether it can also shape the standards around the world. So we see that the internal market rationale hasn't disappeared. It's still there, but it has been complemented by more of an effort to also have global regulatory power. How consciously or strategically it should be deployed, I now get a lot of questions whether um, it could become more of a geopolitical tool. And I am somewhat resistant to the idea that we would try to deploy the tool even for the kind of policies to which it is somewhat more ill-suited. It is partially so effective because it is technocratic power and uh, it does not need to uh, become politicized. It does not get that much resistance. It really relies on the voluntary self-interest of the companies. So it has the limited ability to be deployed for geopolitics, which doesn't mean that the EU should not deploy other tools to be more assertive, but there's limits to which it can deploy the Brussels effect. And it can undermine a policy instrument that has served the EU's goal to spread these policies through this way. Right. Thank you. I have, we have one question from, one more from Axel, actually, and I think that will be all of the time that we have uh, for questions today. So take it away, Axel. Well, thank you very much. You actually answered my question already, because one of the final questions, I want to feed in a little bit to the question also on the SDGs and, and so on, is what you describe in the book is actually potentially a very powerful tool for global governance, in a sense, exporting certain standards and norms which might for instance directly uh, speak to the sdgs and and uh, the previous commission the previous high representative presented a global strategy for europe to position europe in the world and actually also to influence uh, world affairs and and the global order and when i was reading your book your book in a way is analytically explaining why the brussels effect is there and how it works but i was actually wondering to what degree can it really be used strategically? And you already answered uh, it in, in, in on, the, on the previous uh, uh, question. Is the question, can you really make a strategy around the Brussels effect? Or will the Brussels effect just occur according to the, if the conditions are in place as you described them in the book? So I think you can make a strategy around in the following sense. So the Brussels effect helps you understand where the markets do some of the work for you, which would help you prioritize your political uh, uh, agenda. So you know that what the Brussels effect does and what it doesn't, and when you know what it doesn't, that's where you need to rely on diplomacy. That's when you put a lot of effort into engagement with uh, uh, like-minded allies with, uh, through international institutions to complement what you are doing unilaterally. So in that sense, I think it's important to be aware of its strength, of its power, as well as of its limits. 
so that you can have an overall strategy which consists of many different tools, including the Brussels effect. Right, thank, thank you, you very much. I think that's all the time that we have today for questions, but we have several others, so I will pass them along to you, and um, perhaps you can engage then with these speak these askers uh, in in the future. But uh, I would like to thank both of our speakers today, Professor Anu Bradford and Dr. Axel Marx, as well as all of our audience members today for taking part in this webinar and for sending in so many interesting questions. And before leaving you, I would like to announce that the GLOBE webinar series will continue next month with a webinar featuring Professor Vivian Schmidt on her latest book, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone. And you can register for that webinar and check out the rest of our fall lineup online at globe-project.eu. And you can also watch all the previous episodes of the GLOBE webinar series, including this one, uh, as of tomorrow and check out our publications and blog series um, at that website. So thank you so much for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>